Uh, great. So um, as everyone who's seen the invite to this, you probably know I'm going to be talking about Strapi. Um, and I'm going to get right into it. Uh, first, just a quick little uh, about me. Um, and actually, before even I get to that, I want to thank Lucas, Jim, and Stephanie uh, for putting this virtual meetup together. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I hope everyone enjoys your presentation, comes out of it uh, you know, knowing more about Strapi or at least being inspired to do something. Uh, but again, about myself, uh, I'm a full stack developer. I've worked with different technologies, but I do like JavaScript the most. Uh, you know, it's definitely my strength. I've uh, worked as an English teacher for over 10 years, and I still teach part-time. I've uh, worked doing sales as a credit card processor uh, as well, and I learned a lot about sales there, payment industry, and uh, got me interested also in e-commerce. Uh, I'm also a DJ, uh, more as a hobby, but I do have a DJ business. And uh, when I built my first website, it was for my DJ business. And that's what really got me into wanting to learn more and get into web development. Uh, so I took some classes, started learning on my own, um, and I started doing a lot of freelance work to build a portfolio. And I started getting referred to a bunch of people. And that's uh, when I kind of pivoted into becoming a business that I call Rightcode. Uh, and so I really got into using React, which is how I came to using the Jamstack. And I found Strapi by recommendation of a, a friend of mine who's also a developer. Uh, and I'm using it now for some projects I'm working on. Uh, and right now, the biggest thing I'm working on is a, a uh, online marketplace for therapy materials. Uh, so it's e-commerce where people can upload materials, sell them. Um, and I'm using the Jamstack to do that. Uh, so I'm using React, Strapi, and MongoDB as my database. Uh, so enough about me. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about Strapi. So I want to start with what is Strapi? It's an open source Node.js headless CMS. Uh, it's built on top of Koa.js, which is also uh, a uh, Node.js framework. Um, the name Strapi comes from Bootstrap API. And uh, the great part about Strapi is that it comes uh, it's a back end that features out of the box a lot of features that you can customize. Uh, it comes with a, a GUI admin portal uh, that you can use um, as your CMS. Um, and again, the, the great part about it is what they uh, promote it as is build a back end in three minutes or less, uh, which if you use you know, a quick start, uh, you literally can have your back end made in a few minutes. Um, the uh, more difficult part, which again is not very difficult, is customizing it. Uh, but that's also the great part, is it's very customizable. Um, so I already kind of got into this next one, why use Strapi? Uh, it's easy to set up, uh, comes with a lot of built-in features. Uh, I love the documentation. Uh, you know, Everything I do, um, almost everything is right there in the documentation. So it makes it really easy to do those customizations once you get it started. Uh, there's a lot of good tutorials if you want to try it out. I highly suggest uh, checking them out. There's uh, all kinds of different projects that you can do uh, if you look online. Um, and uh, again, it's headless CMS, uh, which is great because you can build one back end with multiple front ends. So if you're doing something like, uh, you know, making a web app online, uh, you know, desktop app, and you want to have a mobile app linked to that, you know, you it's not like uh, something where they're all coupled together. You know, because it's headless, you can you know, build one back end and use it for multiple front ends. Uh, and again, the other great part is very quick to get it started. So uh, what I want to talk about first is the main built-in features, uh, which are the plugins. Uh, there's a content API, uh, which again, it's a GUI. Uh, which you can use to create content types, uh, create fields within that content type, uh, set parameters for the fields. Uh, there's a content manager for uh, entries where you can perform all kinds of CRUD operations, and, uh, creating, updating, deleting, all of that. Uh, uh, there's also user authentication built into it. Uh, so uh, again, through the GUI, you can manage the users, uh, their roles and permissions, 
Uh, and you know, right out of the box, when you do the initial build, it creates public and authenticated roles. Uh, so it's a lot of stuff that uh, we used to have to do manually ourselves that, uh, you know, again, you can have in just a few minutes uh, with just a simple build. Uh, there's also file uploads built into it. Um, and the initial build allows you to upload files for up to 200 megabytes. Uh, it can be configured for larger sizes if you need that, but I think that's uh, generally pretty acceptable. Um, and it uploads upload files to the server, uh, but again, you can customize it to use external content providers, and we'll talk more uh, about that soon. I'm gonna get more into detail on all of these things. Uh, there's also email built into it, so you can programmatically have emails sent from the server. Um, that is also customizable to use external email providers. Uh, and the last major feature uh, and plugin that comes with it are these cron tasks and automation uh, for things like um, timed and automated actions. Uh, and the best part of you know all of this is you know it's all out of the box, easy to use. Uh, and again, you can build it in just a few minutes. So uh, going through each of these in a little more detail, uh, and with a default quick start, uh, which is what we'll do today. After I explain a little bit about what all this is, I'm going to make a quick blog so you can actually see it in action because uh, I know uh, all of this right now is just kind of a lot of information I'm throwing at you. And once we actually start using it, uh, all of this will start making a lot more sense. Uh, but the quick start uses SQLite, uh, but it is uh, what Strapi calls database agnostic, meaning you can use both SQL and non-SQL or no SQL. Um, and you can see here on the slide, it uh, supports currently SQLite, PostgreSQL, MySQL, MariaDB, MongoDB. Uh, the one caveat is using uh, no SQL. There are a few functionalities in it where it treats it uh, like an, it's an SQL database. And that's really just because, you know, since it is database agnostic, to make sure that it is compatible with everything, um, there are kind of a few places where that happens. But generally, I mean, in the end, you are communicating with a NoSQL database, so you do get pretty much all of the functionality that you would want. Uh, the uh, next thing is uh, the endpoints and controllers. Uh, again, I mentioned that it can do all the CRUD operations. Uh, it is a fully functional API out of the box. Uh, and you will already have, when you do the quick start um, or any kind of setup, you know, find, find one, count, create, update, and delete. Uh, it's also really easy to customize these controllers. So if you want it to be you know, slightly different than um, just returning something. Um, you know, with a find, it will return everything. If you want it to return you know, just one type, you know, you can easily customize it to do that. Um, and to do that, you would actually probably want to do an additional custom endpoint in controller, which you can also do. So you can update the existing ones that are built in, uh, but you can also create uh, your own new ones. Um, and with the file upload, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it uploads by default right to the server. Uh, and it is also customizable uh, to use uh, providers. There's plenty of them. Uh, as you can see on the slide, if you uh, look up through NPM, uh, this is actually the terminal command you would use. Uh, if you look down here, the Strapi provider upload. Um, that's a command that you would add on the end, whatever it is that you want. For example, if you're using AWS S3, you'd add that right onto the end, and it'll uh, build the package for you right there. There is a, a little bit of customization you would need to do uh, within your code, but uh, it's mostly done right there for you. So it's, uh, again, really easy to customize and really quick to do. Uh, uh, the next thing, email, um, it, it comes with uh, email from the server built in, email templates are built in, uh, again, all customizable. Um, here's a quick list of uh, email providers that you can link to. 
Uh, same thing here. You have uh, you know where you can search in NPM. Uh, to see the different uh, provider packages they have to link up to those. And uh, so, again, uh, already there for you, but easy to customize exactly how you want it. Um, and then user authentication, uh, which is, again, a right out of the box, already set up. Um, you can uh, set up, you have already an authentic authenticated and public roles. Um, this is, is easily managed right through the admin portal GUI. Uh, you can also add more roles or change them if you want. Um, as I mentioned I'm working on a, a, a uh, e-commerce uh, online marketplace. So in that one, for example, I uh, changed or I removed the authenticated and actually created two different authenticated roles uh, being a, uh, a vendor and a buyer. Uh, and obviously I want the public so that people can go right on the website before they've created an account and be able to view the products and all of that. Uh, so it has two roles built in, but you can add as many roles as you might need. Um, some other add-ons that people might commonly use. Uh, there's a GraphQL plugin. I know that's becoming more popular now. A lot of people like to use it. Um, API documentation, um, they utilize a Swagger, uh, which again, there are a lot of plugins added on to Strapi that uh, you know, are also open source projects. So and again, one of the great things about this is since all this stuff is open source, anything you want to customize, most of it is very easy. If you want to get really deep into it, you know, all the code is right there available um, you know, right on GitHub for pretty much anything you want to customize. Uh, you can also build your own custom plugins, um, and there are more than these. These are just kind of some uh, typical things that people might want to use. Uh, so, as I said, I threw a lot of information at you guys all at once right here, um, but I want to show you how it actually works. So, um, we're going to build a quick blog uh, using Strapi, and to do this, um, uh, if you're following along and you want to um, do what I'm doing on your own, uh, if you're watching this live or if this is recorded and you want to follow along, I created a uh, GitHub repository. Um, my GitHub is uh, slash jreich and Strapi presentation is uh, the repo. And this is really essentially just a React app. It's the front end. Uh, because we're focusing on Strapi as the back end, we're going to build that all together right now. Uh, you know, Because we're focusing on the back end, I didn't want to spend time on building the front end at the same time. So um, while we're doing this, you can clone this repo and uh, use it to follow along. Uh, and we get started. We're going to first uh, build our Strapi backend. So if you go to your terminal, as you see here, uh, you'd want to use, I personally use Yarn, uh, but I wanted to add NPM for people who aren't using Yarn. Uh, but again, just click the Yarn create a Strapi app. And my project can be whatever you want. So I'm going to call it blog backend. And we're going to do a quick start. Again, this will set it up with, uh, uh, with SQL Lite on the backend as a database. And this will take a minute or two to start up. Uh, again, no more than three minutes. Uh, while we're waiting for this, uh, I guess I want to ask if anyone has any questions, if you want to put them uh, in the chat. Hey, Jesse, I had a quick question. Yeah, go ahead. Does, um, does Strapi support, um, I, I know uh, for like cloud providers, it, um, you listed uh, Google Cloud Platform and Amazon Web Services. Is Microsoft uh, Azure yet supported or, or not yet? I'm pretty sure it is. I, I 
I feel like I remember reading that it has been. I've never used it with Strappy myself, uh, but I'm almost sure I've read that it does. Uh, I can't imagine it wouldn't because they really have set it up to kind of link with all major providers. Hey, can you guys yeah. hear me okay? I'm sorry? Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Cool. So um, for those of you that didn't know, uh, my name's Derek. I'm a solution engineer with Strapi. To answer the question, we do support Azure. Currently, we're not recommending using web app. We've seen some issues with actually getting the project started there and not entirely sure if it's an issue with us or if it's an issue with Azure. But um, for VPSs on Azure, it'll work just fine. Great. Thank All you right, for that. Good Thank you for providing that, Derek. Really helpful. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you're here to help me out. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, this build should be almost done here. And uh, this is the longest part of the process, really. Um, Jesse, I had a question. Yeah. Um, so all these kind of integrations, so you talked about like the, the file backends, like Lucas was mentioning with AWS S3 and then um, some other services. Um, like when you're integrating things like that, are you just downloading community NPM packages to set those integrations up? Or is that like supported in the core project itself? Like what does that process look like to hook up something like that? Um, so it's a little bit different for kind of each, um, you know, each customization, but generally, yeah, you're, you're gonna install like an NPM package and then you know, now that it's built, I'm going to just open here. Uh, I need to remember I called it blog backend. And I'm going to op open up uh, the code in the repository, uh, my code editor, just to show you guys. Huh. I'm not seeing anything here. Oh. But yeah, uh, to, sorry, to answer your question, um, generally there's an NPM package that you'll download and then uh, within your code base, there's uh, some files you would just usually put in. Uh, for example, you know, if you're, I used it recently to link to uh, AWS S3 for, um, you know, providing files, uh, I downloaded or installed the package into it. And then in a config file, I put in, you know, the all the data, you know, to actually link it to my specific account. So it, it's really as easy as that. You put the package in and, you know, plug in your information of your account. And I mean, it's pretty much as simple as that. <laughs> cool. Great. Thank you. So, oh, I wonder if you open why. it manually. Yeah, that's what I was just thinking I might have to do. <laughs> yeah. Try one last time. Just hit. If you click open folder, maybe you can just. Yeah. yeah that's weird. I think I have it right on my desktop. Hmm. Um, if you click open editors, let's open that. No, oh, that's just this. Um, so weird. Very odd. Because I can see it all right here. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, try it one more time and then try try opening it from like the welcome screen that you you get there. Maybe that. Yeah, I actually just closed it by accident. Uh, yeah. Open it right back up. Huh. Oh yeah, it's not going to open from here because this is just. Oh, like sorry, I meant like the welcome screen in in VS Code. Like that's. Oh. That's Let me try this. Okay. Let's 
so weird. Huh. And of course, uh, when you do the presentation, is always when something goes yeah. wrong. <laughs> that's so curious. I, do you have to open it as a workspace, maybe? I'm trying to think of why that's not opening. Well, workspace would be something different. Yeah. <laughs> That's the weirdest thing. Yeah. What if we forced closed everything and reopened it? Like forced closed at VS Code and just reopened yeah. it? Yeah. Try to cycle it through. Yeah. yeah. It's a good, it's a good idea. Oh, okay. There we go. Uh, my uh, my laptop fell apart. I had to get it fixed by Apple, and it wiped everything. So I think uh, some of my settings, I just got it back about a week ago. So huh. some of the settings are still a little quirky that I need to uh, get going. <laughs> sure. Uh, but all right, we're back. We have it here. So uh, as I was saying, you know, if I wanted to uh, build a content provider, uh, you know, in my config, uh, or actually, let's go with the database. It's right here. Um, you know, for example, I, I uh, told you that this is, you know, set up with SQL Lite initially. Uh, if you were to set it up with a different one, it would have, you know, a different, obviously, client here. Um, but again, if you have, uh, you know, for the project I'm working on, I, I used uh, uh, MongoDB Atlas. So again, I just had to, I, I set it up not with the quick start, but you know, with the settings to uh, use MongoDB. And then I just had to plug in essentially my, my login information for that database right in this file. And uh, it worked you know, almost right away, which again, I mean, that's, I, I think the, the bottom line of all the things I'm saying here, the great part about it is you know, everything is really pretty easy. You know, just install packages, plug in a little bit of information and you're good to go. <laughs> uh, but now that it's working, I, I am going to log in and I'm just going to use my name. I'm not going to use a re real email right now, but I'm just going to say admin at mail.com. My favorite password of password does actually require a capital letter and a number, so password one. And we're in. So um, now that we're in the portal, I want to just point a few things out. You've got the nav bar on the top with uh, information, logout profile of the admin, uh, a lot of different languages. So if you are um, you know, multi bilingual or multilingual, you can set pretty much uh, you know, any language you want. There's plenty of languages to choose from. Uh, there's also here, you'll see documentation, code examples, um, you know, all their social media uh, to connect with them, uh, which there is a great community to answer questions as well. Uh, but the most important part here is what you're going to see on this bar on the left. And you'll see the collection types. As I mentioned, uh, the users, uh, user type is already created. Um, we have the content types builder, which I'm going to show you guys in just a moment. And uh, the media library, which I mean, uh, is where you know, any files you upload will be available there. Uh, roles and permission, uh, I'm going to just click on that quickly. As I mentioned, you already had the authenticated and public role right out of the box. Um, marketplace is, you know, more different types of things you can use. Again, here's the graphical UL I mentioned. Uh, so this is a really easy way to use uh, some you know, extra plugins, uh, settings plugins. But what I want to focus on right now is our content types builder. Uh, and again, this is all stuff that you would normally be doing with code. Strapi makes it really easy with uh, you know this GUI graphical user interface of creating all this stuff. Um, so what I want to do since we're going to build a blog is first uh, create 
a content type. Um, and actually, you have collection types, which is used for uh, things like uh, a blog post, for example, that we're going to use now. They also have this single type, uh, where if you are doing something like a single page uh, that you want to use uh, you know, this strappy backend as a CMS, uh, this is a great way to do that. Because uh, obviously, you're not going to have more than one page, so it would be a single type. Um, component is a little more uh, in depth, and I'm not going to get into that for this uh, presentation because I'm just kind of skimming the surface of what you can do here. Uh, but I do want to make our first collection type, which, uh, since it's a blog, I'm going to call it article. Uh, and with each of these, you can see uh, advanced settings. We're not going to mess with that right now. Uh, and right away, you have these options of uh, fields for the collection. Um, so first, for this, I'm going to make a title. And again, you have all these options here, short text, long text. I'm going to keep it as short since it's just a title. Uh, we also have these settings here. I'm going to make it a required field because a blog post without a title is really incomplete. Uh, then I'm going to add another field. And for the body, I'm going to do uh, rich text, which is essentially uh, using Markdown, uh, which again, if you're using it for something like a blog uh, as a CMS, you know, then you're Whoever you're making it for will be able to use that markdown on the back end. And I'm going to call this one content for the blog. I'm going to also make it required. And then um, I'm going to make a slug for each blog post. And uh, with that, I'm going to use a unique identifier. So I'm going to call this slug and attach it to the title field. So when the title is created, the slug will be created automatically. I'm going to also make this required. And the last thing, I'm going to make a media type, a media field, I should say. And this will be our image for the blog post. I'm not going to make this one required. Click finish, and we already have our first content type. And if you look in the code base now, if you click on API, oh, uh, one thing I need to do is still save it. And you'll see now in collection types, you have articles. And you noticed before it was empty, but now we have article in our API. Uh, and this is where you can really get uh, down and dirty with the customization. Uh, so you have in the config folder the roots. As I mentioned, it comes right out of the box. You have find, count, uh, find one, create. Uh, so all these things are already built in. And you can use these uh, endpoints right away. Uh, you also have controllers, uh, which is empty now. Uh, the default controllers are all built in. You won't see them here, uh, but you'll find in the documentation it's very easy to find them. Uh, so these endpoints are controlled by the controllers. And um, you will see how to customize that in a moment. Uh, so what we're going to do next now that I've showed you this, is in the back end, just create an article. And again, if you're using it as a CMS, this is the way you would do it. And uh, first one, I'm just going to say Strappy is a great tool. And again, as I mentioned, it uses Markdown. So we can use something like this. It has a great little uh, Markdown editor right here. So Strappy. Um, it is an open source headless CMS that can get your back, back end uh, set up really quickly.
And we're going to add an image here. You'll see when I created the title here, Strap is a great tool. Slug is automatically created here. Uh, and the image, I have a few images uh, already set up for this. Where? Um, I have a strappy image for this. Save it. And now we have our first content type saved here. You can also configure the view if you want to move these things around, see it a different way. Um, uh, that essentially is creating something on the back end. Um, the next thing I want to do is actually go back to the content types builder and add one more field to the article. Uh, if you're doing a blog, you're probably going to want an author of each article. So we're going to create a relation. Uh, and again, the user content type is already created, so it's right there. And um, I'm going to say uh, should be user has many articles. Right? A user should be to create as many articles as they want. And rather than user, I'm going to name the content type article. And so now, again, you see it right here. I'm going to save it. Uh, saved right in there with the fields. If you look at the user, you'll notice it's also there as well because it is relational. Uh, so again, really easy to cre create a relation. Uh, and you don't even need to use code. It's all right here in the GUI. Uh, and again, I like to just point out, if you look back in here, uh, article, you'll see the models. You can see all the information here um, of these things we created, content, rich text, slug, UID. Uh, so again, everything is right here in the code if you want to get down and dirty with the code and actually customize it there. Uh, so you have the option always of using the GUI or getting right into the code. And it's all you know, easily laid out right here for you to find those files. Uh, Great. Right. So the next thing I want to do is uh, create a user and then assign it to the article so it has. Uh, so it uh, has an author. So with users, I'm going to do add new user uh, and. I'll create a username. I would use jreich. jreich at mail.com. Again, not my real email. My favorite password, which is password. I'm going to set them as confirmed. And then, as I mentioned, because uh, I'm going to make it authenticated, because it is a relation, I can already make him right here as the author. And if I click on it, We'll see here, uh, Strapi is a great tool, is my article. Go to articles again. Uh, article. Uh, yes, Jay Reich is the author. Uh, and let's see, I did make an error here. This should be author, not article. So we're back to articles. I'll have to set this again since I changed it. But again, go back to user. All right. And he has the article. Good. Um, so that's great. Uh, next thing we want to do quickly is make these articles public so we have the roles and permission again all easily managed through the GUI uh, I'm going to make public able to find find one uh, and because I'm going to create one not as a user normally I wouldn't do this but um, just for the sake of this presentation I'm going to allow the public to create one I'm also going to have the authenticated role set them so they are able to do these as well. The other great thing about this is when you click on it, you can see on the right side here, uh, if 
if the user wants to find an article, you know it is a GET request with your URL and uh, articles here. Uh, again, find one, you have articles uh, with the wildcard ID, um, and allow them to create, update, delete if they're an authenticated user. And so, uh, again, with the content types we have now, uh, we've already set the roles and permission. Again, a lot easier than using code. All done right here through the GUI. And next, uh, after we make these articles public, I want to render the articles on the front end and see how this is really used, uh, rather than just using it for, as a CMS. So um, just going back to my GitHub repo, again, if you're following along, uh, you can uh, clone this repo. I'm going to make a new window here. I always like uh, my workflow. I like to have one window for my back end, one for my front end. Uh, I'm going to get back out of this folder. And here I'm going to do get clone and get our front end. Uh, this one's a lot faster because it's a very simple front end. Uh, into the folder, and again, I'm using yarn. If you're using npm, you can use npm start. Oh, uh, I've begun. I uh, need to install the dependencies. So if you're using npm, uh, npm install. If you're using yarn, you can type yarn or yarn install. And this should be quick. And once we get it going, uh, you should see that first article show up on the front end right away. So it's all built, yarn start. Actually, going to put this right back on the same tab so we have everything in the same place. And you can see our first article rendering on the front end. Uh, and you can see again that markdown is working. Uh, and we have the author here. So, working on the front end, but now I want to show you uh, how we can create an article on the front end. And uh, Actually, before we do that, um, you know, out of the box, uh, as I mentioned, you have this endpoint uh, of uh, find one, uh, but it searches by the ID. Uh, what we want is to search by a slug. So right now, if you click on it, uh, it's loading. Uh, if I spent more time on this, I would have actually had it error rather than just loading, but again, uh, focusing on the back end here, not the front end. So to get this to uh, load, again, you'll see the slug is right here. So now we're going to create our first custom endpoint. Uh, and again, the whole point of all of this is I want to show you guys how easy all of this is to do. So uh, for an endpoint, uh, you always you want to go in your API folder, article, controllers, because uh, we do need to create a controller and an endpoint, and it will go right in here. Um, and again, one of the great parts about Strapi is the documentation. If we go to Strapi, in the documentation, uh, we can just type in controllers. You see a bunch of information here, but what we really want is these are the default controllers. Uh, again, you don't see them here, but this is really um, what is uh, being used here if you haven't customized it. So again, we want to find one, and it's really as easy as copying and pasting this code and then updating it. So we will need sanitize entity because we want to make sure that everything is clean when we send it in. So we'll put this right here, top of the file. 
And then I'm going to copy this find one controller. And what I'm going to do now to customize it is I'm going to make it find by slug. Um, and rather than search for the ID, we're going to have it send a slug. Uh, and this CTX has all the information of the request. Uh, CTX.params is actually specifically where all the information you send will be in there. So slug is one of the things that will be sent. And um, one other important thing to remember, all of these examples are uh, using a restaurant as an example. So if you do copy and paste like I'm doing now, you want to make sure that you change this. Uh, so it should be article. And it's also here, article. Otherwise, it won't work because uh, restaurant doesn't exist uh, in our project. And again, we want to use slug here. Uh, and this is just using ES6, a little syntactical sugar. It is the same as saying slug is slug. But I like to keep it short and simple. Uh, so I believe that should be all we need there. And then I'm going to also create a custom endpoint. Uh, which again, I'm going to do a little copy and paste and update job here. Uh, it's almost the same as the find one, so I'm going to copy and paste that. Uh, but oh, we're going to put a slug. Um, we can't use articles slash slug uh, because it will confuse it with this one. It'll think that the slug is an ID, so I'm going to actually just add on slug slash wildcard slug. And this handler here, we want it to match uh, this, find by slug. So uh, you'll see it's article, uh, because it is this article file it's getting it from. And then find by slug is our controller name. So we're going to save that. Uh, one last thing we need to do is now that we have a new endpoint, we do need to add it. Uh, again, we can do that easily right through the GUI. I'm going to do it for the authenticated as well uh, by slug. And again, you can see here uh, the endpoint I just created shows up right here. And now we should be all set. If we go back and now click read more. Bam, we have our article. It is searching by the slug now. Uh, so this is a very simple, easy example of creating a custom endpoint. Uh, if you want to get way more detailed, again, it's all JavaScript. So you can use you know, all uh, these uh, methods. You, know, you can use you know, filters, map, uh, you know, all these different features uh, right there in uh, your uh, in your controller. So, uh, you know, you can, I've made controllers that are way longer than this. This is just kind of scratching the surface here. Uh, but now that that's working, I want to um, next do a, um, create an article on the front end. And uh, I know I'm going a little long here, but we're almost done here. Uh, so. On the front end, you'll see create new post. Uh, and I have set this up to actually show you. It's very simple front end I made uh, with create article. It will, um, it's sending it as form data because we are adding an image, but you'll see. Uh, it will be a post request to articles, just like we saw uh, when we allowed it in the permissions. And I'm just going to quickly uh, make something. It's a React. It's a great tool. And again, I set it up so you can, uh, because it is rich text in the content. Um, you know, I again not focusing on the front end. I didn't make any kind of uh, markdown editor here, but you can kind of manually put some markdown in here. Uh, so I could put something like uh, act uh, 
is a simple script framework that makes building interactive pages simple. And then again, I have an image already here. Uh, it looks like I'm getting an error here. Let me figure out what is going wrong. Uh, create is working. Actually, I'm not authenticated at the moment, so. be able to create hmm. give me just a moment to figure out what's going on here oh yes so the problem we're having here uh, that is not actually showing up here uh, is our slug has to be defined. So in the back end, I forgot that I had set this up this way. Uh, when we create an article, uh, as we see here, the slug is automatically created. Unfortunately, that's not done in the front end. So again, I'm going to show you guys how to do another customization. Uh, and uh, looking through it, uh, again, another great thing about Strapi is you can look up all the code right on their uh, repository. So GitHub uh, Strapi slash Strapi. And uh, I'm going to look up exactly, just to keep the code the same, how they create their UID. So this is something I use a lot. Um, this is the core repository for all of this. And click go to file. We want to make a UID. And if you look it up, uh, you'll see a few things here of UID. This top one right here, you'll see uh, generate UID field. So this, if we were doing it in the back end, is how it's done. Uh, I know you wouldn't normally find it this easily, but I did actually find this in about five minutes when I was preparing this. Uh, and you'll see it uses Slugify. Uh, so we know that Strapi already has Slugify uh, as a dependency because it's being used here. Uh, so what I'm going to do is actually just copy this and put the dependency right in my endpoint. And I'm going to be using it uh, for create. And actually, what we're going to have to do uh, to go back one more step is uh, create a custom create endpoint. Uh, and this time, you'll notice, because we're using uh, multi-part, we are uh, adding an image. I'm going to need to add multi-part here. But then, aside from that, again, I'm just going to copy the default endpoint. And with this one, you'll see that uh, CTX uh, is also, again, what is being sent. So uh, we can use ctx.params to get the title. And I'm actually going to do this right in here. And you'll see it actually extracts the data from there. So I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to add the slug to it. So I'm going to say data.slug equals, um, again, going back to the slugify. So I'm just reusing, oh, reusing what's already in the code, slugify. And then I'm going to say slugify. Data dot title. 
And so now we should have a slug in addition. Let's try this again. Do you have to change the restaurant? I'm sorry? It still says restaurant. Do you have to change that? Oh, uh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> That's probably the uh, most common error I make while I'm using this. And even though we're not going to use this down here, uh, or actually, this we don't need to, but I'm going to change it anyway. Uh, but thank you for chiming in there. And now it is working. So again, we have this new post. Uh, click on it. We have our slug here that is working, and it's finding it by the slug. So again, uh, all of this is pretty easy to do once you get comfortable knowing how Strapi works. Um, and uh, how much time do I have now? Because I wanted to try and create a user and uh, do that as well, because you'll notice that there is no user here. Uh, do I have enough time to do that, or uh, am I eating up into a Aristotle's time? I want to defer to Aristotle on um, timing of his presentation. So Aristotle, you're on you're on a mute at the moment. Did Aristotle hop off? Hey Aristotle, I think you're on. Oh. Yeah, I was on mute. Sorry, y'all. Um, no, I'm only going to be about maybe 20, 25 minutes, I think, max. Okay. Okay. Well, I don't know. So so we have so we have the room to eight. So if you um, if if Aristotle, if you're comfortable with 20, 25 minutes, and I think we have the time. I think um, Jesse, after this, we'll probably won't do any questions, and we'll go right into Aristotle's presentation. Okay. But I'd say, I mean, it's it's super interesting what you're doing. So if if you want to show the user thing, I think you could. All right. Speak. Yeah, it should be much longer because uh, most of it's already set up. So yeah, Great. let's jump right back into it. Um, and actually, I was doing this earlier, so. Uh, let me just make sure it looks like there's a token already made, which shouldn't be because uh, I have it saved in local storage. So I just want to make sure this is for me practicing this earlier today. So there shouldn't be any user logged in. Um, uh, but it is also unknown because we haven't added that uh, to it. So uh, I do want to register a user. Uh, and I'm going to make, uh, I'm just going to call the user Jamstack. So jamstack at mail.com. Password. I always like password. So I've logged in, and now you will see um, the token is there again. Uh, I saved it in local storage just for simplicity of doing this. Um, but again, even though I was logged in before, it is still unknown as the author uh, because there's one last thing we need to do in this create, uh, which is add the user. And uh, again, we'll have to customize it to do that. But um, the great thing is with Strapi, uh, it has a JSON web token built into it. Uh, you can also use Passport if you want to do things like uh, you know, use a Google login. Um, so all that stuff, again, is built in, and you just need to customize it to take advantage of it. Um, and so what I'm going to do now um, is uh, customize this and add the user. So uh, with CTX, uh, when oh, actually before that, I left the header out before uh, because if there's no user logged in, it would uh, it would uh, create an error every time we try and do a request. So now that we are sending a token uh, because I am logged in, I'm going to put the header back in here. And when it's received on this side, uh, you can get that uh, using uh, the CTX uh, CTX dot state dot user and um, again because there's not enough time I, I don't want to do it but I did want to show kind of a, 
a console log of what ctx.state gives you, uh, which it does show you, um, you know, if there's a, a web token, the user data, um, if you're using Passport, it'll give you all that information. But just to make this very quick, uh, I'm going to add to data dot author. We have the author of the post. And rather than manually putting in who you are, if you're logged in, it should be able to do that uh, programmatically. So we're going to use ctx dot state user. And then we want to use the user's ID uh, again because uh, it is uh, a relation. The ID will uh, populate the author. And if I'm not mistaken, that should be all we need. And I'm going to do one last post. Uh, let's say post with an author. Say the author is populated by using a JWT JSON web token. And this one, again, I have an image. Let me use a JWT. And you'll see I logged in as Jamstack. We now have an author Jamstack. So going back to it, it's as easy to get the user as just using this uh, ctx.state uh, user ID. Um, so that is uh, really it. Again, there's a whole lot more you can do with it, um, but I don't want to eat up any more time. Um, and uh, that's really it. I had all these things that we just did in the slides. Um, and just uh, if you do go through this afterward, I can send you guys out the slides. Uh, it has documentation for a lot of these steps uh, right in here. Uh, but just quick overview of what we learned, how to do a quick start project, create a content type, uh, create an entry in the admin portal and the front end, uh, create a user in the admin portal and on the front end, uh, create relations, uh, manage roles and permissions, and uh, create custom endpoints and controllers. Uh, and again, there's a whole lot more to it than that, but uh, this is really scratching the surface, but it shows kind of how easily it is to do those customizations. And uh, I'm going to just skip through this. This is, again, useful for the jam stack. This will put the A in your jam. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Thank you, Jesse. Great job. That was great. Thank you, Thank you so much. That, yeah. was, that was really something. I feel like you covered a tremendous amount of material in that amount of time. Um, I, I have questions. I think other folks probably have questions. I hope people stick around and, and, and ask you some afterwards. I want to just hop over and um, uh, reserve some time for some strappy questions, and then we'll open it up to anybody who wants to talk about anything else in the last couple minutes of the, of the night. Um, it, the, does anyone have a question um, for Jesse on the strappy presentation, the first presentation of the night? Yeah, I actually had one quick question that I didn't ask earlier. Well, I know I, I asked one earlier, but I had a, a follow-up question for you, Jesse. So um, with MariaDB, I know that was listed as one of the um, – one of the databases that that is supported um, that supports Strapi, um, is that a MySQL or a NoSQL database? Because I'm not familiar with it, so I'm just curious. I'm actually not very familiar with MariaDB either. Um, I always thought it was a NoSQL because it sounds like it would be related to MongoDB. <laughs> uh, but I was reading about it the yeah. other day, and I, I think it is actually an SQL. Oh. It's, a, it's a MySQL, it's not a NoSQL. It, yeah, it, it is a, an SQL, not in NoSQL. Yeah, it's an, I think it's an alternative to MySQL. It's a similar concept. Um, David, yeah, David just said um, is a fork of MySQL. Okay. Yeah. All right, that makes sense because I had the impression at, at a first glimpse that it was NoSQL, but I appreciate you clarifying that for me, David. Yeah, yeah, I think, I, think uh, I I had the same. Uh, I thought the same thing, and I think it's just because it it looks so similar to MongoDB. It looks like it should be related in some way. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what I, that's exactly what I thought too. So that's why I was curious. Um, yeah, so I, I met I met the MariaDB guys at 
a tech conference way back. Um, yeah. and I think it was like some folks had concerns over Oracle um, controlling MySQL or something like that. Um, so that yeah, yeah, you can see in the chat. Um, yeah, MariaDB is open source. Oh, that makes sense. So it's basically like an open source MySQL. Mm. Yes, That's basically, funny, basically what happened was uh, Sun bought the MySQL Foundation, and then Oracle was buying Sun. And at that time, a bunch of the devs from the MySQL project left because Oracle was going to close source MySQL, and they started up the MariaDB Foundation and offered that as a drop-in replacement. <laughs> oh, I see. So, so the developers left SQL like when when they got bought by Sun, which was bought by Oracle, then they and they kind of started their own open source um, SQL database. Exactly. Yeah. And there's there's oh, a lot of extra benefits cool. with MariaDB over MySQL with the Galeria clusters. Interesting. That's cool. I feel like that could be its own presentation right there. So uh, is that David that's speaking or who, who's speaking? I don't know. Uh, Derek. Derek. Oh, Derek. Oh, OK. Derek, you should. Uh... <laughs> If you ever want to talk, we we love to have another. <laughs> By all means, uh, I could talk for days about Streffy. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, that we would love to have you. We should connect afterwards. Um, <clears throat> I, I had a question, yeah, Derek. Thank you for tuning in. It's a pleasure to have you as a guest. I've actually seen you speak before, and uh, I've read some of your stuff online. So, uh, it's a pleasure to know that uh, you're watching me now. <laughs> Yeah, no problem. It's it's kind of a running joke in the community that I've got eyes all over the place. <laughs> oh, 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 wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, Jesse, so in the end of your presentation, you did um, you did that cool thing where you, you, you posted back to one of your endpoints and it got the user information. So is that getting it because you're, you're logged in on the actual Strappy application in the same browser that you're posting to or how did I like I was kind no, of that that was all uh, it was so again one of the things built in is it uses JSON web token mm -hmm. um, and I put it in the log I didn't really I guess put in a place enough attention on it but I, I logged it in the console so you could see that there was a token in local storage uh, which I know for security purposes isn't necessarily the best way to do it but for a presentation is fine mm -hmm. uh, so you can send you know, bearer token in the request. And then within it, uh, that CTX that, that you'll see in each of those controllers has pretty much all the information you're going to need to, you know, manipulate it and do anything you want with it. So it'll have, you know, all the information that's sent in the request. Um, and if you send a bearer token, it'll also have the user information included. Uh, you know, it'll, uh, you know, take the bearer token and determine who the user is that's logged in. And then from there, you know, rather than having to put in your user information manually, you know, if you're logged in, it knows already who you are. Mm -hmm. Great. And you, you mean logged into Strappy, right? Yeah. Well, I, I had it actually logged in in the front end. Oh, logged in on the so front it, end. It okay. wasn't actually at all connected to oh. the back end there. That was completely through React. Oh, interesting. Okay, I, that's what I didn't realize. Okay, so logged into the React app. Okay. Yeah, because actually, if you look, when I logged into the back end, I used my name. Uh huh. Uh, when I did that blog post, it was the Jamstack user, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, username that I created. So it was actually, it was a different user. Yeah. Okay, that's really cool. Um, I, yeah, because I think what I wanted to show with all that front end stuff is, you know, you have all that, you know, CMS back end, you know, GUI stuff. But, you know, you have the option of doing all of that, you know, the front end is, you know, really just as strong as that, you know, obviously, you don't have the, you know, the graphical user interface, you have to build that yourself on the front end, but, um, you know, it, it's all available to use, you know, anything you can do on the back end, you can do on the front end as well. Very cool. Um, and then I had another question about, uh, so when you're pulling in the blog post, you're, you're pulling in uh, sorry, the articles you were pulling in the information. Then there was an entity reference to the author, and you're pulling that in. So were you like doing two GET requests to get that full information, or were you using GraphQL, or how were you getting those two different entities and then putting them together in that single like display that you had on the front end? Um, no, it's just one request. It's right. just, uh, essentially there's the relation there. Um, 
so you know since SQLite is you know an SQL database, um, you know it has just saved in there the the reference to the ID of the author. Um, so it's basically it's doing the joining of the tables for you. Oh, okay. And if I wanted to get like, so so say that author, you know, it's a it's a user object, right? And say the user had favorite TV show associated with them. Could would I be able to pull that information by doing it like an article re request? Would I get all user information from that? Yeah. Um, okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. It'll um, again. You know, I, I reference it by the ID because that's usually how you're going to want to find something. Sure. Um, but when it, it, actually in the ctx.state.user, um, what I use is ctx.state.user.id. But I could have just as easily accessed any other information about the user, you know, by using dot, you know, username dot uh, email. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, and another nice thing is, you know, if you get into the customization, you can also kind of hide any of that data. You know, not everybody wants everybody to be able to access their email, so you can, you can again customize, you know, the responses from the back end. To make sure you know someone can maybe look up their username and articles they've created, but not necessarily get their email. <laughs> awesome, that's great. Um, I'll, I'll ask one more question, and then uh, in risk of hogging the the airtime. But um, and Jesse, if you don't know this, maybe Derek can help. But um, is there a hosted solution for Strap? Is is this kind of like you spin up your own um, server to host it, or is there a hosted uh, solution that you can just pay monthly? For there, no, there's no real hosting solution. Um, I mean, what's easiest to use uh, is probably Heroku, mm -hmm. um, but it, it's pretty easy to launch on there. Um, I, that's what I'm using. I'm sure you could use other things, but I know right in the documentation, you know, it shows you how to how to throw it right up on Heroku really easily and quickly. Awesome. So yeah, to kind of build on that, we don't currently have a hosted solution. It's in our pipeline of something we're considering, but we really wanted to focus on being self-hosted and letting people do with the code whatever they want. When you start getting into SaaS type applications, you begin to lose some of that control over not just the data, but your code itself, being able to update it locally and push it somewhere else. You can do that with services like Heroku. Um, if you actually look in our documentation, we have a digital ocean one click. I actually built that <laughs> oh, nice. before before I joined Strappy, and then they hired me on later. So, um, cool. Yeah, That's so you yeah. to get a job <laughs> uh, using, uh, using Docker. Yeah, uh, there's a, yeah a bunch of options there. If you want my kind of subjective opinion, because I kind of feel comfortable with you guys, me personally, I don't generally recommend Heroku, just the way that they handle their dynos. Um, if you're not constantly accessing the Heroku dyno, it will basically kill the project. And then once it starts to see traffic come up again, it basically pulls all the code from GitHub and spins the project back up and you get like a cold boot delay. So oh, wow. when you're dealing with something with like a digital ocean VPS or even in some cases, you know, like Azure, or whatever, um, you don't have that cold boot delay and the code's always running. Now, if you're doing with something with Jamstack like Gatsby or, you know, any of the SSR style front end applications, you don't really have to worry about that because you're only really connecting to Strapi just long enough to build your your bundle and then deploying that into a CDN. That's great. Yeah, I'm a big DigitalOcean fan too. Um, so that's that's cool. Um, great, thanks for, thanks for the input. Other folks have questions? Okay. Well, we pretty much maxed out our time here. I, well, let me check the chat real quick. I see a couple of things coming through. Um, it's just like some conversation. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't have anything else. This was great though. You guys did such a good job presenting. I really appreciate you putting all the work in there. Um, we'll, we'll try to Thank do another. You, yeah, of course. We'll, we'll try to do another meetup next month. Hopefully we'll see everyone there again. Um, in the meantime, we have Twitter. Uh, if you want to reach out there, Jamstack Boston, um, hit us up. If you know anyone who's interested in speaking, connect them with us, and uh, hopefully we'll see you all next month. All right. Peace. All right, guys. Take care. Thank Thanks. you, everyone. All right. Thanks. Bye.
Have a great night. Take care. You too. See ya.